Please be seated. So if you see me dart out right after the service, it's because uh, I'm taking my children to camp, and my son has told me if we don't get there early enough, his shot of getting a top bunk is, is deeply uh, uh, diminished. So I have to get there quickly, and it's my daughter's first ever camping experience. She'll be gone 12 days, and she's uh, excited, but this is met with considerable trepidation, both for her and for her parents, as she's never really been away from home other than a sleepover or with family. So we've gone to great lengths to make sure she's adequately prepared. We've read and reread the list of things that you should pack. Uh, and you should pack all these things. As it turns out, uh, the trend has been for several years since I was at camp, uh, a locker. So she's got a pink and yellow locker that her, uh, her cousin, who's already been through the camping process, has given to her with the cool stickers on it. Uh, she's got everything checked twice. Uh, my son does uh, as well. He's got my dad's old military locker, uh, and he's a little bit less worried. But as parents, you want to make sure your child has everything, partly because you don't want them to end up in a situation where they don't have what they need, but more often because you don't want it to be told that the parents didn't adequately prepare their child for camp. <laughs> but I can hardly imagine myself saying, Marley, don't worry about the fact you don't have a flashlight. It's an opportunity to depend on one of your fellow campers a little bit more, and maybe you'll stir up a friendship. No, we'll have batteries, backup batteries, and two sources of light to make sure our child is adequately prepared. And I imagine the parents who sent their children off yesterday on the mission trip, which I will join them uh, Tuesday, felt the same way. They wanted to make sure that their child uh, was prepared, although by the time they get to teenagers, as long as they have clean underwear, we're pretty satisfied. Uh, we no longer feel like it's a full reflection on us as parents as much as, as, as theirs, uh, uh, their own. Uh, but we want to make sure our trunk is full. Either for us as we go on our trips or as our children uh, go into the world, we want to make sure they're prepared for everything, that they have the security uh, and, and the ability to know that they uh, will never need for anything, that they will never depend on others, that they are self-sufficient, they have everything they need in their trunk. And so we get to the story of Naaman, which is a fantastic story. It's one that Jesus uh, brings up to the people uh, in the Gospel of Luke when he says, uh, don't you remember that we've always been reaching beyond our borders? Don't you remember that Elijah uh, uh, brought food to the woman uh, outside of the, uh, uh, of, of the Israelites in the time of famine? Don't you remember that Elisha healed Naaman, even though there were a lot of people in your own tribe that suffered leprosy? Uh, so it's a story about breaking out. It's also a story about caring for a Syrian uh, 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 who happened uh, to, to fall on an unfortunate uh, uh, situation. So Naaman is a mighty military leader. He has won victories in several battles, including one against uh, the, the Israelites. And amidst the plunder of one of those uh, battles, uh, his wife uh, has acquired a... Uh, a maid, a Jewish maid, uh, who when, uh, uh, when Naaman was struck down with leprosy, uh, says, you know what, uh, my God could heal you, and nothing else has been able. All the money and all the might in the world has not been able to heal Naaman. So out of desperation, he says, absolutely, we will go, but there is an incredible amount of pride lost when you go to somebody that you've defeated in, in victory and said, my gods can do nothing. Can your God help me? So one way we, we, we soften the blow of that damage to our pride is we come bearing gifts. We fill our trunk with gifts so at least we're even. We're not indebted. So his king sends 800 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. I might be able to work miracles for that kind of money. Almost a thousand pounds of precious metal and 12 outfits. And he goes, uh, and the king receives it with even more shame than Naaman and his king sent. Not only did you defeat me in military battle, but now you bring this fool's errand upon me. I can't kill, cure this man. This man has leprosy. I can do nothing. But there's two almost voiceless, weak characters in the story who actually become the ones who wield the power because their trunk is filled with the Spirit of God. 
the servant woman, the maid, and Elisha. Elisha says to the king, I might be able to call upon my God uh, to help this man. And so Naaman comes to him uh, and he says, uh, go wash in the river Jordan and you will be healed. Naaman, who's already gotten a couple dinks on his, uh, on his uh, pride, uh, says, what are you talking about? I thought you were supposed to lay hands and then I would start doing something like this. And all of a sudden I'd realize that I had uh, you know, baby bottom skin and it would all be taken care of. He said, go wash in the Jordan. And having recently been to the Jordan, I can say it's kind of a murky, not very impressive river. He said, what, what about Syria's got great rivers? Why not one of these great rivers that I could go and bathe in? Uh, I, I'm a mighty warrior. G give me one of my own rivers. And another one of the voiceless, one of his uh, servants says to him, Naaman, if he asked you to do something really difficult, would you have done it? Absolutely. He just said, go and bathe in the Jordan and you will be cured. Is that too much to ask? And he swallows his pride. Let's go of what he's carrying in that case, in that trunk. And he goes and he's, he's healed. Then we get to the epistle. Uh, the epistle is a continuation of the story that we've been telling for some time. Uh, and Paul is getting so uh, fired up about uh, trying to help heal these wounds that have taken place uh, between uh, these, these factions uh, within the church in Galatia, uh, that he steals the pen from his scribe and starts writing in bubble letters, practically, uh, the rest of the story. And he says to them, stop it. Stop filling your trunk with things that you think give you security or power or assurance that God somehow favors you and realize that the only thing that can fill your trunk the only thing that you should boast upon is not whether you're circumcised or not circumcised, uh, whether you've, uh, your family goes back several generations in the church or whether you're brand new to the church, but the only thing that can fill your trunk and give you the peace and the power and the joy of knowing your true reality is the cross of Jesus Christ. By realizing that you're a beloved child of God, so loved by God that God never, ever let go of you, that God poured out God's love for you, only in knowing that truth can your trunk be filled and you be able to carry that out into the world. No matter what you stuff into that trunk, it is worthless, apart from the knowledge that you are a beloved child of God, held forever, even unto death by God. That is the only thing that you can put in your trunk that will truly be able to to allow you to celebrate who you really are and to bring in the kingdom of God. And he tells them, boast on that. When you boast on that truth, on the power of the cross, the kingdom of God breaks in. The kingdom of God is built up when you let go of all of those other things and you truly celebrate that truth, that a God loved you that much to spill out everything for you then a new creation can be born. But we still lag that trunk. And Jesus, who's a pretty bright guy, by the way, uh, says the same thing. He says, go. And he calls upon 70 of them to go. 70 because that's the number of the nations uh, of the world believed at that time. 70 because it's a sign of fullness and completeness. 70, the number of people that, uh, that, that Moses called to go with him to the mount. Uh, 70, the number of times, times seven we were supposed to forgive. But a number that signifies uh, the totality of, of, of the world. Uh, go out into the whole world. So he sends 70 and he sends them in pairs because as we've learned uh, that when we minister together, we're more effective. When we go out in pairs, we're able uh, to care for one another. But he says, go out and take nothing. Be vulnerable, which is the key for transformation. Uh, when you go out, assuming that you have everything to offer and nothing to receive, it's very ineffective. So he says, go out. Depend on the people that you go and minister to. Stay at their houses. Get to know them. Get to fill your trunk with the gifts that they might be able to offer to you. And then something, some spark might take place and something might be built up. <clears throat> when they can offer some of their gifts to you and you can offer some of your gifts, the power of the word to them, something might be able to be, to be planted and grow and, and, and be fertile. Uh, but when you go with the presumption that 
you have everything you need, and, and basically you're just going to offer up some of what, what you have to others, it's much more harder for things to take, take root. And that's one of the things that I, I beg and I, and I reaffirm every year when I go down on the mission trip, uh, that they realize is that no matter how many uh, nails that they hammer into the wall, no matter how many walls are built up, uh, it's more the walls that are broken down uh, that make the trip. Uh, that the purpose of the trip is not uh, in, in whole what they build or what they accomplish. Uh, just as Jesus says, it's not the miracles that you do, uh, but it's the glimpses of the kingdom of God that take place. It's the people that invite you into their house, however modest it may be. It's the people that show you a different reflection of the body of Christ. It's the people that offer you hospitality that jars you in some way. It's the learning that you get from seeing brothers and sisters that, uh, that look and act and worship entirely differently than you. It's the ability for you to expand your understanding of what it is to be brothers and sisters in Christ. It is those moments, uh, those opportunities to fill your trunk with the spirit and the life uh, of, of, of the fullness of the body of Christ uh, that allow the trip to be as fruitful as it can be. And so my prayer for them uh, is that they take an empty trunk and that it not be the, uh, the soiled uh, 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 laundry that they bring home, uh, but all of the richness of seeing the kingdom of God being built up that they put in and that they bring back and that that spills out. And that us who... Uh, Shouldn't be patting yourselves on the back for being here in the middle of a holiday weekend on the 3rd of July. You came to church. Uh, that's not what we boast on. We boast on the fact that we come here to hear the truth that God loved us. God loved us so much that God spilled everything for us. And when we open our trunks and we fill our trunks with that, that's when we can walk out of these doors and truly celebrate that the Spirit of God is upon us that a new creation can be born, and that the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen.